Good morning, Cross Community Church. It's good to see you this morning. Happy New Year's Eve, right? Tomorrow's 2024. Yeah, no one wants to cheer that out. Okay. Stuck in the past, man. Come on. Guys, I'm glad to be here with you today. If you don't know me, my name is Joey Bottoms. I'm the youth pastor here at Cross Community Church. And uh, this is National Youth Pastor Preach this Sunday morning sermon day. You know, it's, it's just one of those, there, there's a few throughout the year that, that automatically go that way, and I was blessed enough to get to uh, preach this message for you guys this last Sunday of the year. And, you know, uh, on the eve of New Year, this New Year, as far back as I can remember, uh, I have been setting a New Year's resolution, or like a New Year goal. Does anybody do that? Anybody relate? Uh, Not a whole lot of New Year's resolution people in here, but uh, yeah, you know, years ago for me, it was like, this next year, I want to land my dream job, or I want a new truck, that's my goal throughout this year, I'm going to work hard, extra hard, uh, do whatever it takes to get that truck, you know, it's things like that, superficial, young, silly kid stuff. The older I got, the problem that kept happening in my life is I kept getting fatter, and uh, I was always really slim growing up, and so I started setting my New Year's resolution to lose some weight and to kind of keep that weight off. And, you know, uh, for the first day or two, I'd, you know, pull that chicken breast out of the fridge, throw it in a pan, stick it in the oven, and like, I'm eating chicken breast, baked chicken breast, 365 days this year, I'm going to lose all this weight, I might go run a mile, uh, that worked, you know, for a few days, maybe a week or two, and then I would uh, see something, a sweet or uh, something I, I didn't need. It wasn't part of my diet, or I wouldn't feel like getting up and exercising, and so a little here, a little there, I would begin to uh, fail on my New Year's resolution, and uh, I'm one of those optimistic guys, and I don't want to not get the resolution, so it's like... It's no longer try to lose some weight and keep it off. Now my New Year's resolution is this. Try not to gain too much weight. Right? Is there anybody with me? You know, the the resolution changes a little bit uh, throughout the year. Question to you, why would this happen? The answer is simple. Compromise. Compromise. Now, there isn't anything wrong with compromise in general. But this morning, I'm not talking about a beneficial agreement between husband and wife to keep the peace at home. Although somebody after first service came up and told me that what I should mention to you guys is that how many times is someone happy when compromise happens? Period, right? Husband and wife, they keep the peace, but neither one of them gets what they want, right? And so with compromise, there's rarely anybody happy. But I'm not talking about all that this morning. When I say compromise, and when I talk about that throughout my message here this morning, what I'm talking about are those small, subtle decisions that build up over time to cause large consequences. Let me give you guys an example. For those of you that don't know this about me, for about seven years of my life, I worked at the prison in Hodgin. I was a correctional officer out there. And uh, when you first start out in corrections as an officer, they're preaching to you constantly, don't be compromised. Don't become compromised. And what they mean is this, don't allow the inmates to compromise you. Don't allow the inmates to trick you, to fool you, and to get you in a place of being compromised okay they're telling you that constantly and luckily for me throughout my seven years there at the prison I escaped without being compromised and I thank God for that because there was temptation it was difficult they're really good at what they do those inmates in prison and so I escaped but in my first year of corrections I had a really close friend that wasn't so lucky and so let me share this story with you guys to help you have an understanding of what I mean when I talk about becoming compromised, okay? Now, my friend, 
he chewed tobacco. He dipped snuff, okay? And uh, for those of you that don't know this, you're not allowed to bring snuff into a correctional facility. It's actually a felony to do so. And so what he and what I would do, I dipped snuff for several years as I worked out there at the prison. What we would do is we would take our personal use snuff can, we would stick it down in our sock or we would stick it in our big baggy pocket on our uh, combat uh, pants, okay? And if somebody caught you, they kind of knew one little can, half empty. It was for personal use. It wasn't that big of a deal. Although it was a felony, right? That's a pretty stupid thing to do. I regret doing it. But this particular officer, he got himself in a position where he was too friendly with some of the inmates that would spend a lot of time with him. And so what he started doing was he would go into his personal use snuff can and he would give an inmate or two, a pinch of snuff as they became buddies. And there's nothing super duper wrong with giving one dude a pinch of snuff. That seems like such a minor offense, right? But it's never just a pinch of snuff. It's never just one time. What that pinch of snuff turned into was, hey, man, can you bring me in a cigarette? I'm not really that big on snuff. That cigarette turned into a pack of cigarettes. And that pack of cigarettes turned into pounds of tobacco. And you know what? Those pounds of tobacco that he would bring in for these inmates turned into a pound of weed that he had to drive all the way to Pine Bluff, Arkansas to get from a guy that he had never met. Feeling hopeless not knowing what to do, this friend of mine, and I had suspicions, but he comes to me and he says, here's the deal, here's what's happened. I told him he was crazy. We went through that whole process. He wasn't as lucky as some. He was investigated. He lost his job. And somehow, maybe by the grace of God, He wasn't prosecuted for bringing contraband into a correctional facility, a felony that would stick with him his entire life. But he did lose his job. What I want you to know about this story is when he gave that inmate that first pinch of snuff out of his can, he did not expect to become compromised. But those small, subtle decisions led to large consequences share another quick story with you guys. You may not know this about me. You may. From the time I was 10 to the time I was 17, my dad was locked up in federal prison. And the circumstances that got my dad into prison were drug-related. He sold drugs. He used drugs when I was a child. Okay? Now, I'm pretty confident that when he began to use those drugs and sell those drugs when I was just a child, he never intended to miss some of the most pivotal, important moments of my life being locked away in prison. But what happened in his life was he made small, subtle decisions that led to a life of being compromised. That's what I'm talking about here this morning. Compromised especially here in this church setting, uh, speaking to uh, an audience, a group of believers gathered together. We're talking about being compromised in relation to the Word of God, what God considers right versus wrong and good versus evil. Compromising when it comes to God's commands, you know, it's not something that we want to do, right? Right? How many of you woke up today and you're like, I don't want to get compromised according to the Word of God? Like, no, it's not something we wish to do, right? You wouldn't wish it on anyone else. But if we aren't careful, we can get caught up living in a life of sin. We have to be careful. For each of us, you know, compromise looks a little bit different. But I just wanted to share with you guys a few areas of my life 
in which uh, uh, I have struggled with and that have led me into living in compromise, okay, living in a compromised lifestyle. Now, one of the things that was really influential in my life that led to me living a life of compromise was the people that I hung out with, the friends that I had. When I got saved, there were still people in my life that were having a negative impact and a negative influence in my life. And what I had a tendency to do is even as a believer, I would allow these people in my life to influence me to do bad things, okay? And so for me, that is a struggle. Another thing for me, uh, because I have uh, some problems with self-control, my flesh wants to, uh, to try to uh, get the best of me. Uh, some of you know this about my story, but I had a party stretch where I like to drink a bunch of alcohol, and I was not good at drinking in moderation. Some of you, uh, you can have a beer or have two beers, and you're chill, you're good, you're okay. For me, I didn't like to do that. I didn't like to socially drink. If I was going to crack open a beer, I wanted to drink enough to get drunk. Okay, And so for me, even to this day, there's nothing inherently wrong with having a beer or two. But I have to be very careful if I have a drink on the weekend or have a drink over dinner. Because that's something that I struggle with. That's something that can lead me to a life of compromising my faith and my beliefs. Another thing is uh, when the temptation arises... I have a struggle of fleeing from the temptation right away, which is what God wants us to do. The Bible actually says, when you are tempted, flee from sin. What does flee mean? It means run the other direction. The temptation's here, and I'm booking it this way, right? I do not want that in my life. I do not want to slip into that sin. And sometimes I have this problem where I know it's a temptation, but I linger just a little too long. I wonder if that's the same struggle that you have. One of the biggest struggles that I have as a believer, and this is what has led to more compromise than anything, because I believe this is the most important thing we can do as believers, but something I have struggled with throughout the years is failing to devote daily. Because let me tell you this, if you wake up, and you're talking to God, and you're in the Word of God, and you're engaging with your community, and you're staying in an attitude of prayer, daily devoting your life to the one that saved you from yourself, you know what? Compromise doesn't come easy. But when you fail to devote daily, it easily slips in. See, there's many things. We can gradually slip into. Maybe your struggles and your problems aren't the same as mine. But there's many things that can slip into our lives that cause us to live a life in sin. But what I have learned is this. Most of the time when we see or hear about a believer failing in their faith or having a fall, We all know these stories where there's this figure, right? There's this believer, maybe it's a preacher, and you've put them on a pedestal, or they've climbed up and put themselves on a pedestal, and they have this great big moral failure, and they fall, and it's this big devastating thing where tons of people are hurt in that process. What I have learned is those moments of failure are falling oftentimes aren't a single moment lapse of judgment or a spur of the moment decision that they've made. No, but it's a, it's a, a period, a series of small, subtle decisions that led them into a life of being compromised and that compromise was revealed and that was the devastating consequence. And so this morning... I want us to turn uh, to Scripture, uh, specifically the book of Genesis, chapter 19 is kind of where we're going to be focused, and we're going to look at the life of an Old Testament character that's often overlooked, but I, I truly believe we can learn a valuable lesson this morning. This person is Lot. How many of you are familiar with the story of Lot? 
It spans over several chapters in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, right? Uh, this is going to kind of reveal a little bit more. I'm full of confession here today. But I, my daughter asked me last night what I'm preaching about, and I was like, uh, I'm preaching about Lot. Do you know who Lot is? And she's like, no. And I was like, oh, man. There's the moral failure right there. I didn't even teach my kid about the character Lot. But hey, she's here today, and she's going to learn, along with you all, about Lot. So who's excited? If you're excited, say, I am. I am. Good. I like the excitement, guys. Let's jump right into this. Today, I want to talk to you about the danger of compromise. The danger of compromise. Three Things we should consider about compromise. Number one, compromise can have, most often will have, severe consequences. Number two, compromise creates hypocrisy that hinders our witness. And then lastly, compromise leads others to compromise. I'm going to start by telling you a couple of stories that are going to help us get to Genesis 19. The first story is this. It's one found in the New Testament, specifically in the book of 2 Peter, chapter number 2. Scripture reveals to us many years later about the character Lot, that Lot was declared righteous. The Bible says righteous. Lot. So Lot is declared righteous. So at the very end of the story of Lot's life, as they're talking about him after he's long gone and all his life has been lived, what they're saying about him is that he is righteous. So keep this in mind as we look at the full story here in just a moment. We have at the end of the story a man declared righteous by God, but you should know this about Lot. His life wasn't easygoing, it wasn't carefree, it wasn't mistake-free, it wasn't look at me, this perfect Christian kind of thing, okay? Lot was real, Lot was raw, Lot made mistakes, Lot became compromised in his life, okay? He made poor decisions like every single one of us do. It's what I want us to focus on here this morning is that part about Lot's life. Now, let me just share some context as I tell this other story about Lot. Lot was a man that was born into the family of Abraham. Abraham and Lot's father were brothers, and Lot's father passed away at some point in his life, and he was under the roof of his uncle Abraham. Now, we all know who Abraham is, right? Jason taught about him just a couple of weeks ago, and you guys are all faithful to church, so you know that story of Abraham, the father of our faith, right? Okay? Well, we know this about Abraham. His life was greatly blessed by God. He had an abundance of of wealth, an abundance of possessions, and an abundance of cattle. And Lot being under the umbrella of this blessings that God shared with Abraham, Lot had an abundance of wealth, possessions, and cattle. And so what began to happen is their herdsmen couldn't get along. Lot and his uncle Abraham, they did not want to have a dispute between themselves. So Abraham says, Lot, take whatever land you want. We're going to kind of split up. And Lot agrees to this. And the Bible tells us that Lot set his eyes on the valley next to Sodom. And when the scripture tells us this, the scripture tells us this about the city of Sodom, that it was a wickedly evil city with great sinners there. Now, I don't know whether or not Lot knew this about Sodom, but Scripture reveals that to us. And then it says that he moved towards Sodom in the valley of Sodom. We go on in the story. He's an inhabitant in the city of Sodom. He becomes a citizen of this city. This city is caught in a war. Lot is captured as a prisoner of war. 
Abraham, his uncle, by the grace of God, delivers him from captivity, frees him. Rather than going back under the roof of Abraham and just praising God for this great deliverance and these great blessings that he experiences when he's within the presence of God in his uncle Abraham, he separates himself from Abraham again, returns to his home in this wicked city. And when we pick up in chapter 19, what's happened is Lot is no longer just a citizen in the city. He's actually become an influential leader. But we're going to learn that he wasn't very influential, but he was rather influenced by the evil in the city. And so... A hair bit more context than the previous chapter, and we'll jump right in. Here's what's happened. Abraham has had some guests arrive at his home. And in this process, these angels of the Lord, they tell Abraham that Sodom is going to be destroyed. Now, Abraham knows that's where his nephew Lot lives, and so he begins to beg God not to destroy the city of Sodom, which was an evil, wicked place with great sinners. He says, please spare them, God. And him and God come to an agreement that if 10 people in the entire city are righteous, he will spare the entire city of wickedness. Okay, And he will deliver Lot. From the city. That was kind of the agreement. And so these angels, they leave the presence of Abraham and go down into the city of Sodom. I think they're going there to seek out if there's ten righteous so that they'll spare the city and to deliver Lot and give him this message that Sodom is going to be destroyed. And so they arrive at the gate of the city and they find Lot at the gate. Now this is what tells us Lot was a leader in the city because this is where a leader in the city would be positioned where they would cast out judgments and uh, make calls for the greater good of the city and we find Lot here. Lot notices something distinct about these angels, these men and he tells these two angels basically, he's like you guys come stay with me. I can't help but Think that he knew how wicked the city was, and he's like, I gotta get these guys off the street. These guys are from the Lord. I know how evil this city is. You guys stay with me. The angels, they decline. They're like, nah, we're gonna go sleep in the town square. And he's like, no, no, you don't wanna do that. Trust me. Come stay with me. I will take care of you. We'll let you get done what you need to do. And they agree this time. And so right after nightfall, these men are in Lot's home. And here's the reality. When we begin to live a life compromised by sin, much like Lot appears to have done moving closer and closer to this sinful city, becoming a citizen and now a leader within this sinful city, what always happens, what will always happen is the consequences to those poor decisions will come knocking at our door, right? And that's exactly what happens in this story. These two men are in Lot's home and the evil Wicked men of the city, it says, from the oldest to the youngest, show up at Lot's door and they want Lot to give to them the two angels in his home so that they may know them, right? And so we all are on the same level of what that means. They wanted to know these men, meaning do very wicked towards these men. And Lot finds himself in a sticky situation here. He's like, oh, no. What do I do? Do I just release these two men so the men of the city can have their way with them? Because hospitality in Lot's day was way more important than it is in our day. And so he does something unthinkable, unimaginable, something totally unjustifiable. But here's what he does. Rather than releasing the two men to the men of the city, he says, here, men, are my two daughters. They're virgins. Have them and have your way with them. And if you're like me, you can't even comprehend that decision, right? 
But what we need to know is because of his compromised lifestyle and because of the city he chose to live in, in the midst of its sin, it was going to be destroyed. The men in the city were evil, and it was a lose-lose situation. The only win anywhere in sight was for Lot to have faith that God would deliver. For Lot to have faith that God would provide and protect him in this great time of need. But he didn't do so. He took things into his own hands. He offered his daughters. And it was a horrific decision. That's kind of what happens in the first eight verses of chapter 19. What I want to say to you today is this. Maybe you're here today. And you're in this same place Lot finds himself in because of compromising decisions you've been making when nobody else is looking, only things you know about, okay? Because of those small, subtle decisions you've been making, you find yourself in a circumstance where it feels like there's nothing but a lose-lose outcome. Maybe that's you here today. What we learn from this passage is this, that God had promised Abraham that Lot was going to be rescued from Sodom. And I know this about God because I've read the Bible. God is always faithful, right? Has God ever been faithful in your life? You know, we can trust God, but Lot has that problem here. And here's what happens. Rather than trusting God, he offers his daughters. And you know what God does? Because though our mistakes are great, our God is bigger and greater than our mistakes God uses the angels to blind the men so that Lot and his family can escape from their home and get out of the city. And so it's a great victory story thus far. But here's the deal. Here's the dilemma. We need 10 people and Lot's two daughters are engaged to be married. And so that leads us kind of to point two, which is compromise creates hypocrisy that hinders our witness. The next section of Scripture, verses 9 through 14, tells us about how Lot goes to his future son-in-laws, and he's like, hey guys, here's the truth. Here's what's about to happen. The angels of the Lord, they came to me. They told me that this place is wicked. This place is evil. God's going to destroy it. We need to get out of the city. Come on. And they didn't follow him. They didn't go with him. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us this, that they laughed at him. They thought he was joking. He was revealing to them, maybe for the first time ever, scriptural truth, reality, the Word of God. And they said, no. They laughed at him. Lot finally understanding that he needs to be obedient to what God has commanded him to do, leaves his future son-in-laws behind, takes his wife and his two daughters. They just get outside of the city. The judgment of God begins to rain down on the city of Sodom. And what happens? Lot's wife looks back. And the Bible says she turns into a pillar of salt. I can't help but think that his wife was a little salty. Right? Yeah, that was good. So she reveals something to us about the character of Lot that he wasn't a very good spiritual leader in his home. And because of his compromising decisions, He was seen as hypocritical by the people of the city that said, now you've come to judge us when you've basically participated in everything we've been doing up to this point. His son-in-law's laugh in his face. And now his wife looks back to the sins that she just walked away from, revealing it wasn't her desire to do so. What I've had to find out the hard way Far too many times is when I've lived a life compromised by sin and hypocritical behavior, 
followed by an attempt to share the truths of God's word, my witness for Christ was hindered. It's a quick story for you guys. I work at the prison. I told you guys that a moment ago. Well, at the prison, there wasn't a ton of Christians. I was one of few. And there was this one guy that just did not like Christians. And he was always watching me. He was always watching me. You need to hear this. As believers, everybody's watching you, right? Everybody's watching you. They're waiting for you to mess up, waiting for you to fail. Well, this guy's always watching me. And it was so annoying because I'm imperfect, right? And I'm going to mess up. I'm going to fail. Well, one day that exact thing happens. We're all sitting around in a cell house in the office and there's this officer that's kind of a, a little bit of a nerd, and we're all making fun of him, and I'm jumping in, jabbing at him, and I'm helping them make fun of him, and he's giving it right back, but it wasn't cross-like behavior, okay? And this other officer that was always watching me, he was there. Well, fast forward a little bit down the road, and me and this other guy, we're in some heated debate about the truths of God's Word, and I have the Bible out, and I'm trying to reveal to him all these truths, and he says, you don't get it. He looked at me in the eyes, and he said, you made fun of that other officer with those other guys. I don't want to hear anything you have to say, and it hit me. When I live a life of being uh, hypocritical, it hinders my witness, that's just one example of a time when hypocrisy hindered my witness. You know what? It's hard enough for believers to live according to the Word of God in this world. Not to mention us helping the world hate us with hypocritical behavior. It's hard enough for us. We don't need to help the rest of the world hate us. It leads us kind of into our last point. It's this. Compromise causes others to compromise. Now, verse 15 through the end of the chapter, it's a big, long section of Scripture, and I'll let you read it on your own, but what I'll say about it is this. It is an unimaginable, unthinkable thing that takes place in this story. It reveals to us that the apple hadn't fallen far from the tree, that Lot's compromise that was witnessed by his family caused compromise in his two daughters' lives. So not to mention, his wife looks back, revealing that about his leadership and his family. Once, they've, uh, once they flee to the mountains, his daughters are in despair, thinking they'll never have children. And so they take matters into their own hand, and they do have children. Scripture even tells us that the consequences of their compromise would go on to affect generation after generation after generation. What you need to hear from me today is that people are watching you. Your kids, mothers, are watching you. Your husband is watching you. Husbands, your wives and your family are watching you. Believers, a lost and dying world, are watching you. You, we have to take that seriously. How many of us have uh, let a word slip and we kind of chuckle when our kid repeats that word, you know, the first couple of times when they're maybe one, two, three years old, it's kind of funny, you laugh about it, but then this thing continues to grow worse and worse and they're not just slipping out a dirty word at two but they're making comments about TV shows that you're watching in front of them in the living room. And then it progresses to the point, I wonder if this has happened to any of you, where you're talking smack about somebody behind their back with your kids around, and the next time you're face-to-face -face with that person, your kids are telling them the smack you're talking about behind their back. Has that ever happened to anybody? Can I get an amen? Because I know it's happened to me, and it's quite embarrassing. And it reveals a lot about your character. And so people are watching us. And I don't know about you, but I do know about me. And I do not want to cause anyone to stumble. Because I've chosen to compromise myself. Okay? Lot was righteous. Simply because his faith 
was in God. Amen? We too, as believers, are declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. But we can mess up. We can make small, subtle decisions that lead to a life of compromise. And as sad and as devastating as this story I've just shared with you over the last several moments is, there's nothing good about Lot's life. He was Abraham's nephew. That's the best we find out until 2 Peter when we learn that he was righteous, but his righteousness was declared despite his sinfulness. He was a sinner. He rebelled against God. He did not deserve salvation. He doesn't deserve the word spoken about him in 2 Peter. Lot was not righteous on his own, but was declared righteous by his faith in Christ. And that's the only way you'll be declared righteous. It's the only way I will be declared righteous. And so as sad as this story seems and as devastating as the results of God's judgment on the city of Sodom is, I'm encouraged by the totality of the story of Lot's life because I've learned that God is loving. God is gracious. God is merciful. God is a deliverer. See, that's the moral of the story, is that despite our own sinfulness, just as Lot has revealed time and time again, God saves and delivers those that belong to him and is patient and willing that those that do not belong to him will be saved. That's the gospel is that God is saving you and he is desiring that you be saved. And I just encompass the entire room today. He is patient. He is kind. He is full of grace. That means you. Maybe you're here today and rather than being a Christian that loves Jesus and desires to follow him, you've made mistake after mistake after mistake and you think you're not good enough to be saved, you think you can't be saved, I'll say to you today that you are no different than Lot and no different than me. But by the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, I can stand here and say to you, I am saved. I am saved. For those of you that are looking into this new year, 2024, and you're desiring a a closer walk with God, let me give you some helpful pointers that uh, here at Cross, they're not really pointers, but they're reminders of things we're constantly told. And this is one giant one that will change your life. Devote daily. Devote daily. Choose each and every day to follow Jesus Christ. And you know what? You can be closer to Jesus this year, but it will take dedication. And it will take you not becoming compromised in your walk with Jesus. So let me remind you of these three things. Compromise can and often will have severe consequences. Compromise creates hypocrisy that hinders our witness. And compromise leads others to compromise. Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, we just said, we come before you in a word of prayer here, God, at the conclusion of this sermon, God, that I've had the privilege to preach, just asking you, God, very simply, God, May your will be done. If there's one, many, God, that's here in this place that do not know you, God, all they they hear when I speak is that I'm compromised, God, that I'm compromised and I've never put my faith in you, God. I pray that the Spirit would draw them to you, God, and that they would put their faith in Christ Jesus today. God, if it's a believer that has slipped into sin and it's compromise that is bringing to their life consequences, I pray, God, that they would use this time
to get right with you, God, that they would hit their knees, that they would repent of their sins, God, that they would lay it all on the line to be right with you as they go into this new year. And so, God, we ask, may you have your way. Your will be done, not ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, if you'll stand, we're going to worship together. Now's your time to respond. Come forward. Ask Jesus into your life. Come lay it at the altar. Now's your time.